All right, so ladies and gentlemen, we'll get started again with the next session. So <clears throat> this is the last uh, of the late-breaking Ebola sessions of the, of the day. My name is Mike Christian. I'm a uh, critical care and infectious disease physician in Toronto, Canada, and uh, um, also vice chair of the Disaster Network, as well as on the executive of the uh, Mass Critical Care Guidelines. We have an exceptional group of speakers that are able to join us this afternoon, more of a panel talk and um, question and answers. Uh, so from uh, starting on our... Uh, on our left here, um, we have Edgar Humanis, who's a, a critical care physician and uh, extensive background in terms of uh, uh, personal protective equipment and disaster training, uh, who's currently now here in Dallas, um, Edgar. Uh, next to him, we have uh, Jim Geiling, who a retired Colonel Jim Geiling, who's uh, also uh, on the uh, Mass Critical Care Task Force and has an extensive background and was the lead author on the resource poor setting um, uh, uh, document within that. And then next to him, who we all just know, we just heard him speak, Josh, who is from Indiana, right, he said, um, emergency physician and just returned from Africa, and who will be joining us momentarily after he finishes his little interview is Louis Rubinson, uh, who is also uh, known to many people for his years in uh, public health and disaster and critical care, um, and spoke earlier today about his experience in Africa uh, with Ebola. So just to uh, start the, um, the, set the background a little bit though, I'm just going to run through a, a quick little bit of background information and some uh, uh, resources for you in terms of where to find information for your ICs to help you prepare. So just to begin with, I have no financial conflicts and uh, then we'll be not be mentioning any off-label drugs. And the uh, opinions expressed by myself today are those of myself, not the Royal Canadian Air Force. Uh, so this is what my life's been like for the past several months, um, uh, being involved with uh, Ebola long before it sort of was a big scare in North America, but it's uh, increasingly occupying a lot of my days and I'm sure a lot of your time as well as we're all hearing. This is the, uh, uh, you know, this is uh, catching everyone's attention and, and causing a lot of um, concern and, and a lot of uh, activity right now. A lot of people are asking and being asked, is your hospital ready to deal with this? So there's lots of different things you have to think about. A lot of them came up in the talks earlier today. Um, and these are some of the things that uh, uh, to plan for and to, and to think in your ICU how you're going to take care of this and who's going to do this, who's going to be the clinical leadership, um, which of you in the room are going to step forward and say, you know, I'm the one who is going to lead this for my organization and, and be the, the critical care person who can offer that uh, to their group. Um, point of first contact, so as we were discussing earlier, you know, there's that uh, difficulty not having every hospital being prepared to manage a confirmed case of Ebola, but certainly every hospital has to be able to deal with a point of first contact or that patient who just walks in the street and shows up, because we know from disaster after disaster that patients don't go where you tell them to go or ask them to go, they go where they want to go, and, uh, and that's usually not where you would have preferred them to go. So um, every hospital has to be able to deal with that situation. Uh, testing and investigating. How are you going to test patients uh, for Ebola and those who have Ebola uh, do tests and investigations on them? You know, one of the biggest things and most challenging things a lot of hospitals are facing right now are the suspect cases. And in my view, oftentimes the, the dealing with the Ebola case and the confirmed case is often far easier and straightforward than dealing with the suspect case because the confirmed case, you know what you're dealing with. When I was in SARS, I looked only after SARS patients. It was great. I assumed every patient had SARS because I knew they did. And that's different than all the patients that emerge when you're trying to figure out do they have this or don't they. Because in North America at the present time, you have to remember 99.9% .9 of the patients we see that come in as a suspect case don't have Ebola. But they do have something. That's why they're in the emergency department. That's why they have a fever. That's why they're feeling unwell. And you have to, with one hand tied behind your back, figure out what's wrong with them and try to treat what's really wrong with them while you rule out Ebola and manage to provide some semblance of uh, reasonable care for them. Where are you going to provide this care? Where in the, where in the emergency department do you have a, a space to isolate them? Well, how are you going to do that? What are you going to do if that room's full? What's your backup plan for your second and third spaces uh, when the patients show up and you already have a, a big trauma code or something going on? Uh, and when you have to admit, if you have to admit them to the hospital, where are you going to care for them there? Will it be the ICU? Will it be some other ward? Uh, PPE and IPAC uh, precautions are, are huge and we'll hear more about that. As was alluded to earlier in the talks, waste management is a massive issue with these patients, even with the suspect cases, until you rule them out. You have this accumulating volumes of waste that you have to deal with and it's very different than uh, often hospitals have plans for typical waste management. So when you do have to provide clinical care to either a suspect, suspected patient that you haven't ruled out yet or a confirmed case, how are you going to monitor them? What are you going to do for body fluid control? Life support, what are the role for life support? How are you going to institute it? What are the limits on life support that are appropriate or not appropriate to place? 
Um, blood products is a huge issue in these patients, whether they're suspected or not suspect or, or, or confirmed. Um, basically, all of our, our blood testing, group screens, all that stuff, um, cross matches are all based on open type testing. So that's an open tube testing. You can't do that in these patients that have Ebola. So you have to have some way to work them up and to be able to have a strategy for managing them, giving them blood products safely if need be. And then finally, antibiotics and transport. So a whole pile of issues that you have to think about and you have to start preparing for in your hospitals. Uh, we offer the uh, um, supplement on uh, critically, uh, care of the critically ill and injured during disasters and pan during pandemics and disasters um, as a guide for this. Just uh, released this month. It's the second update for the uh, um, for the supplement that's been out. Uh, it's 12 manuscripts, 217, uh, 267 suggestions, 177 pages, all available free online at CHESS guidelines for you. Uh, it covers in the, uh, in the document surge capacity, so a lot of this information about how do you develop the logistics in your, in your system, uh, PPE, supply chains, issues around command and control, uh, evacuation, less of an issue for, um, for uh, Ebola, uh, triage, hopefully not a big issue that we're not going to be having overwhelming cases here, but certainly, as we've heard in Africa, something they face. Um, special populations, system level planning, communication and coordination, as you heard, is essential for this, as is engagement. Um, uh, business continuity of operations, uh, legal issues, ethical issues, and uh, then treatment in resource poor settings, as well as if you're thinking about going to resource poor settings, what to think about. So in terms of some resources, I'm sure most of you have been to the, uh, w been to the CDC page. They've got excellent resources there and they're constantly increasing and in, in improving. Some things you might not have looked at, Emory um, has made their uh, protocols available. You can go to the Emory web page and log on and have access to their Ebola protocol. So it's very generous and a great source of, uh, of information. Uh, the European CDC also has some, uh, some good guidelines and documents they're, they're developing. Uh, they probably have the best document at the moment in terms of assessing and planning for medical evacuation of patients, um, air evacuation. Uh, something to, to look at just came out this past week. Uh, the UK Public Health webpage also has some good documents. Uh, two of the things that they've done quite well is a very nice approach um, to uh, working out patients that are suspect cases and uh, a nice logic diagram to work through for rule in, rule out, as well as a, a, a clinical management, uh, more on the infection control and PPE side, but again, another uh, resource. In Canada, our Tri-Societies of Critical Care Emergency and ID Microbiology uh, got together and back in uh, August we produced the first report, an interim report on the uh, clinical management and focusing sort of on the really how to uh, prepare for and care for uh, patients with Ebola and just being updated this week with a new um, uh, release to come out in the next day or so on the Canadian Critical Care and the other society websites. So when we look at uh, disaster planning, uh, we usually have a motto of uh, stuff, staff, and space are the main things that we look at. And then we look at standard of care, ICU goals, uh, expansion goals, and, uh, and resource. And that's kind of the focus we're going to take today as we go to the panel and ask them questions. To get us kicked off, well, actually, I should remind you that if you do have questions um, that you want to send to us, you can uh, uh, tweet them to uh, hashtag uh, Ebola chest, and then we have people in the audience that are going to fire them to me. And uh, we'll start off just to set the stage in terms of PPE with uh, Edgar giving us a quick run through of some PPE issues. Okay, if I could have the next set of slides, please. Okay. Well, thanks again uh, for the invitation to be here. And I think it's, uh, you know, hopefully in the next 10 minutes or so, we're going to go over some of the critical challenges that we have with uh, personal protective equipment and some of the issues why we have been doing things a little different from before as the CDC initially recommended. You look at the website on the CDC for the last uh, probably 10 years, this has been until last week, the way we were uh, donning and doffing uh, personal protective equipment. And you will see, I mean, donning is not much of an issue, but as we remove our equipment, as we have the doffing going on, um, and there were some challenges, obviously, that were identified many, many years ago for, for people about how, with your naked hand, you're going to be removing your gloves. And if you see this, this is an area of quite concern where you have your naked finger trying to remove one of the areas of possibly highest contamination, which was reported later, and I'll show you some of the uh, evidence that has been published in the, in the last few years. So this, this is an area of very high potential contamination. I mean, you're very close to the patient and, and removing things with a bare hand. So if you didn't contaminate yourself as you were removing your hand, 
uh, and then contaminated everything else, I mean removing your gloves, you will see here, for example, how uh, once you are going to remove your gown over the bare hand, I mean, if you didn't do it on the first instance yet, there's a potential chance that you may do it on the second time around, right, when you're removing the gown over your bare hand. And then, of course, everything else is, is an issue because whatever you touch with those hands is going to be a problem. Uh, this is to show you a lot of what we have learned uh, about how we do things in the ICU. Has, uh, we learned a lot during the SARS epidemic in, in 2013. This is the group in Wanzhou and the Guangdong province in China, where you see uh, in the first instances how they're uh, facing this uh, threat at that time. You see people with bare hands, you know, with regular surgical masks. I mean, probably even, I don't know what else he has in the surgical mask, but, uh, you know, white coats, the chart in the room, there's no isolation at all. There's just a curtain between this and any other patient in the unit. This is, uh, I'm sure, very dear to, to Michael Christian here, where you see the group in Toronto that was one of the developed cities with the highest impact with the SARS epidemic in 2003 where you see how they were approaching at that point in time with double gown, double gloving, with a paper, and inside the paper, an N95 and a, a goggles. I mean, we learned later on that uh, because of the neck being an area of potential contamination during aerosolization, that we would probably need to change the type of paper that we're using, and, and, and that's what we have been recommending in our courses for, uh, probably for eight years. One of the, obviously, one of the highest uh, concerns that we have is the impact on healthcare workers. This is during the SARS epidemic, healthcare workers, and you see also the friends and direct contacts and families, relatives, who, who got uh, SARS, I mean, during that time. So if we look at the, uh, this is one Jew, China, in 2007, during one of the first uh, worries about the bird flu, H5N1, and you see here how they have changed now, and they're using papers, fortunately, to protect the respiratory tract in, in when you're having potential aerosolization of material, and, and how they get prepared. They still use their white coats, though, and, and, and they go like that, but I, I didn't want to talk to him after he came to the room. <laughs> um, there are two major directives that you keep at all times. One is your force protection. You have to make sure that people feel safe when they go to work. Because if you don't achieve that, I'm sure that many people here can tell you the horror experiences that you have had when they say, well, they don't show to work or they have, they have fear of whatever that may happen to them or their families. And then you are facing uh, an increase, a surge in your demands mm -hmm. when you have less personnel to, worry, uh, to work with. So that's very important. The other thing is your facility. You need to know that you have a facility that it is uh, capable of, of standing and has all the proper equipment and physical structure to be able to handle what you have. Uh, in Toronto, uh, during the SARS in 2003, you can see that 56% of all cases of SARS were healthcare workers on their contacts. This is uh, pretty sovereign when you have one of the develop cities in, in the Western world, you know, having to face this, and they still have this kind of results. So there were many publications that came out after that where people were concerned, uh, and, and they were showing that, you know, this is, this is a problem. I mean, they, we, even though we're doing what the CC wants us to do, we, we still have a problem about contamination of healthcare workers. So how do we study this, and this is a, Jorge Zamora from Canada to, had this publication, the Canadian Medical Association Journal in 2006, where he had an interest, interesting study where he combined the two, uh, did a crossover study where you had 23 uh, individuals from this going to the higher popper equipment and 27 in the other direction, and found out that using this, 4% of the people got contaminated uh, in their faces, I mean, with the regular uh, CDC recommendations, that the neck, anterior part of the neck, was 96% of the time. So uh, one, only one in 20 chances of not getting contaminated with your neck with aerosolization in the unit. And 18% in the back, so one in five would get back posterior neck contamination. And the wrist, 76% of the time. So if we look, uh, obviously, errors where some of them are significant, but if you see here with uh, glow germ, 
this is a substance that is uh, aerosolized or splattered into you and, and only you can see it at the end when you use uh, ultraviolet light you were able to see the highest area. So the concerns were true, right? When you see the wrist area, one of the highest areas of contamination, you could see 76% of the time, and 96% of the time, the neck. <coughs> if you see that neck with aerosolization, you can see the shape even of the N95 mask that that worker was using around the, the mouth. Um, this is very serious because the problem is in the ICU, we change the natural pattern of transmission of the disease and we make it unnatural. We aerosolize patients. We, we give them BiPAPs and, and high oxygen, high flow oxygen masks and we intubate and we give bag and boo bag and then we, some people open suction. Uh, you may do bronchoscopies on some of these patients. And it takes time. I mean, some of the best trained teams in Canada, when they had the SARS epidemic, I mean, we would take five, seven minutes and to put it on and remove it. We now, with a little more complex uh, PPE, it may take up to 15 minutes easily in a well-trained uh, group. Uh, I know that the NIH, from their direct reports, that they're taking up to 30 minutes before they uh, don their equipment. So the conclusions of all these studies was that the ordinary gowns, uh, gloves and masks were inadequate, that the technique can result in contamination even if you have a highly protective system. And the, they need to be uh, a correct sequence. You need to know the sequence and you need to know it step by step. And we did a demonstration today at lunchtime. I don't know you were able to attend. And we're gonna try to post uh, some of our checklists. You see a, a pilot goes lands and, and takes off hundreds of times in a year, it's their airplane, and every time they do, they have a checklist because they don't want to mess, they don't want to miss any of their specific points to be able to do it safely. That's what we need to do in our units as well. Casanova also, in one of the articles, a more recent one in 2008, he was doing the same studies, and he found that often with the CC protocols, the virus transfer to hands and closing was very frequent. We aerosolize things in our unit. I mean, this is not the natural way of disease, right? But we do when we make unnatural settings for diseases and we can aerosolize and forget about the three feet uh, concern. I mean, it weighs, goes way more than that. Um, one of the things that I wanted to mention also is that we have looked at ventilators and try to use HEPA filtration on the exhaust ports. It's very important to just keep in mind as some of our uh, response ventilators and for transfer to in ambulances. Keep an eye on that, that if you're transporting a patient that's ventilated, some of the transport ventilators may not have IFA fil HEPA filtration in their units. So some of the tricks of the trade, just to finish here, to go over some of the issues that we take to use not absorbable shoes, very important. In, in the new CC recommendations, you should wear washable footwear. Um, and we have added that to have a strap in the back so you don't leave your shoes behind when you're removing the booties or the, or the bunny suits. Uh, to put tapes anterior and posteriorly, as you can see here, in probably in a better example, and not circumferential. Circumferential makes it very awkward and very cumbersome to remove the personal protective equipment. But if you do it longitudinally, it makes your unit, uh, the, the unit of the gown and the glove comes as a whole. And then you see it here as one time. See, as, as you're removing the gown, you see the, the glove coming off. And we're using two different types of colors here to make sure that we are doing it appropriately. You sit here as well. As you're removing the, the glove, the other glove is coming. This It's less uh, clear here because the gloves are the same color. <coughs> and then repeatedly, based on whatever substances, uh, based on whatever uh, material you use for your gloves, whether it's nitrile or whether it's uh, latex or whatever you're using at that point in time, make sure that you use chemicals that are disinfectant, whether it's bleach-based or alcohol-based, but that will not affect or break down your material. Have enough papers at this point in time. I think if you have the risk for aerosolization, you need to consider this and have a paper unit. Uh, the materials that we use are materials that are not absorbent, and most of the companies have been very nice about that, that all the fabric that was used in the past for these improvised materials now are um, used, we're using plastic that are easy cleanable 
for, for further use. As you can see here, these were the previous papers that we used that would leave the neck unprotected. Now we're using the large uh, hoods that cover shoulders and neck at the same time. And these are some of the masks to deliver high flow oxygen and now have HEPA filtration as well. Uh, you need to look with your provider so you can help the patient and, but not to provide a, an aerosolization problem. And you can see here in the back where also as you use the paper, the blower in the paper with the battery and filter uh, complex, the assembly, that makes sure that you learn how to tie it so no, none of the flappy surfaces will obstruct the airflow of the filters. These are some of the things that you will see. We're going to post uh, some of those checklists on, on chest uh, later this afternoon. Um, just for us, the, the crisis that we had, we have a system, Baylor Scott and White, that it is uh, we were just, uh, not jokingly, but, but seriously mentioning it is about having Vermont, New Hampshire, and Massachusetts in one area together, the, the, the area of those three states. It looks very small in Texas, but it, that's how big it is. We had 43 hospitals, or half 43 hospitals with over 500 clinics. And just to put it in context, we have to, from the beginning, put a, an incident command system. There's no way you can control this unless you have a good organization structure where you have the information that you need handled by one group that makes sure that all the protocols are up to date and the flow of information, whatever you need to give to your healthcare workers as well as the public in general, it is it comes with one voice where, where things get coordinated. And then you have to develop very clearly protocols for every single level, from ethics to a scope of treatment to your codes to how you're going to do with screening PPE to the healthcare worker that's treating someone on PPE, all that has to be spelled out very clearly, and we hope that we'll be able to provide this. I just want to finish by thanking everybody. This has been a joint effort with SCCM as well, the Society of Critical Care Medicine and CHESS, the American College of CHESS Physicians, and I hope that uh, we will be able to help you out in the, in the next few minutes uh, if you have any questions, and also, obviously, Baylor Scott and White allowed me to bring some of our equipment and, and some of our instructors that we did the demonstration at noon. Uh, thank you so much. All right, thanks a lot, Edgar. And my panel just changed. I looked up and realized that you are not Lewis. <laughs> oh, Lewis is over there. We have uh, Mike Connor from Emory joining us. And uh, okay, so actually, I'll start with you then. First question, uh, Mike. I, um, that was a great summary about uh, the PPE, but you know, one of the things you emphasize really is the role of training. And I wonder if you could just uh, tell us a little bit about uh, you know what goes into and having been trained yourself for for PPE there, and uh, and some of the factors, and particularly the human factors that uh, and, and you emphasize in Emory for uh, for your PPE mm -hmm. use. Well, thanks again for letting me uh, join this. Uh, I think Lewis and I have to go to the airport eventually, so I might have to step away before the uh, official end of this. Um, to answer your question, um, first of all, I'm, I'm not the sort of director of our, um, of our unit, uh, and so um, the, the protocols and the standards, I'm merely somebody who is trained under the, the current uh, system that we use. Um, we, we have an ongoing training. Um, we, we went through a sort of two to three hour sort of training course uh, the first time and then um, as we've had patients we had a gap of about 10 days or two weeks where we didn't have any patients and then when we got our third patient everyone was sort of refreshed again uh, to make sure that even though people had had um, all the nurses had experience we didn't want anybody to have sort of forgotten steps along the way um, and we use a, a checklist sort of uh, protocol like you do. Um, uh, to, to sort of make sure that everyone's going through every steps uh, the, the right way every time. That's great. And one of the things Lewis is in here, I'll mention one of his points he brought up earlier, which I think is really important, is that the, uh, the, uh, what's called a, an observer in many cases, but the safety officer or the buddy really has to play an active role, not just a passive role in, in doing this, and actually walk the person through uh, donning and doffing, particularly when they're tired and fatigued coming out of the, uh, out of the environment. It's important that you have someone who actually controls it and, and, uh, and keeps that person on track as opposed to just sitting there to make sure, checking off what they're doing or not doing. Um, actually, for you now, Josh and Jim, so uh, talk about the African context for a minute because a lot of people in this audience may be considering, you know, deploying over there to help out. Any thoughts or words of wisdom you have for them, for someone who's thinking about uh, deploying to that setting and the, the preparations, what they need to think about before they go? Well, I'm going to start with Jim. Sure. First, kudos to the group here who've actually done the hands-on. And we'll talk a little bit more if you're interested at the, at the next discussion on the 
global health in, in a resource poor setting. But I think outside of the specifics of treating Ebola, a couple things. First is your own personal preparedness. Um, you have, frankly, as, as Lewis sort of pointed out, you've got to be reasonably healthy. This is a hot, stressful kind of place, and so you have to be personally healthy and be willing to sort of endure that. Your family has to be really supportive of you going. Um, this is a different kind of animal. This is not an earthquake. This is your life is you know at risk because of the um, because of the agent, if you will. And I think they saw the similar kind of lack of people volunteering to go to Fukushima as well uh, when that took place. So your family has to be on board. Clearly, your coworkers do. It's uh, those of us who had the opportunity to go in the rear, somebody's pulling extra calls, somebody is seeing your patients and the like, and so you may be at the tip of the spear getting all that attention, but your, your workplace. Uh, and then the last thing that I would sort of say, and I'll pass it off, is to make sure that you're going with a well-organized, well-orchestrated uh, organization, because going by the, flying by the seat of your pants, especially in some kind of setting like this, uh, could be potentially dangerous. You know, I, I absolutely agree with that. I was actually asked to go back with an organization that didn't have a great logistical uh, understanding of the city, uh, didn't have an exit plan, didn't know how they're going to get back, and, and I think that's, that's fundamentally, you know, something you have to do. You have to understand where you're going to get food when you're staying there, where you're going to be staying, uh, you know, and, and just kind of the logistics. So uh, a, a good organization with a good organizational plan, I think, is, is phenomenal. The thing I would emphasize is how hot it is. <laughs> in West Africa. I mean, and that's something that, I mean, I just don't like muggy heat. And so when you're strapping on, you know, PPE, and I've done the FEMA trainings and stuff like that, when you're trying to operate in, you know, 90 degree, you know, 90% humidity with full plastic all over your body, um, you just get really, really hot and sweaty and uncomfortable, and you're more prone to make error, I think, in those kinds of situations. So having that, that really calm and organized and thoughtful approach is something that you have to really drill into your head because when you're in that kind of uncomfortable hot environment it just makes you not not as focused yeah, that's great um, coming back to uh, the, the western sort of context more a little bit um, Edgar maybe you could talk to us about how do you prepare your staff you know we talked about the training but outside of the training what are your thoughts in terms of just getting people ready in your unit for dealing with this and then um, Mike if you have any comments afterwards that'd be great I think that the, probably the most important thing is, 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 as you have the flow of information, is to keep them well aware of what's going on and to make them feel safe. I mean, if, you, if they don't feel safe, people are not going to show to work. They're going to have excuses. And, and uh, besides the training, which is very important, you know, you have to make sure that, that they are aware of what's going on, what's being implemented. And, and a clear train of thoughts on, on, on how not only you're implementing it, but how you're training. I think that uh, uh, on, on one side you have that, on the other side is uh, we have requested, and we were perplexed by the amount of volunteers that we had. I mean, when, when we, no one is being forced to do this, but we had a, an incredible response from the emergency department nurses and from the ICU nurses and saying, no, we are here and we're here to do it as long as they get trained well. I mean, I think that has to be in context, the, the, the big nature is to do it safe and to make sure people feel safe before they get embar embark in any of these issues. I also think that uh, one of the things that we've been having discussions with in our organization is just honestly uh, an HR discussion. So people who do end up volunteering for this having you know extra life insurance uh, policies for them because I mean this, this is something that our families have to bear the brunt of if, if we end up contracting this, this disease. So it's something for your organization to think about. Did you have anything when you went uh, overseas in terms of extra coverage? I, I, no, I only had my own personal, yeah. Okay. yeah. And what about Emery? What are you uh, doing there for preparing your staff? Uh, well, I don't, I don't think we're getting any uh, <laughs> extra benefits. Uh, we might have to, that was, I think, a very, a, a very important thing. Um, uh, I, I agree that, you know, we used only um, ICU nurses um, and other highly qualified people. We had a few emergency department uh, nurses as well, but primarily we sort of prepared for the worst that these, even though most of the patients we've had have not done that poorly, we prepared for patients who might be critically ill and needing advanced, various advanced life support, so we wanted to make sure we had the appropriate staff in place to to help with that. Um, I think if, even though you might be getting lots of volunteers, it's important to make sure that 
that the people that are actually chosen to be part of the team is not necessarily everyone who volunteers. If you have more volunteers than you need, you need to make sure you're picking people who are going to be highly committed, who are um, pay attention to detail in their job in the ICU in general. Um, not that any ICU nurse doesn't, but we all know that there are some that we think are better than others. Uh, and making sure that we have you know, an appropriate group because we're all responsible for everyone else's safety. It's a team thing. So if you have a weak link in your safety uh, or, or if one of your staff is, is not as, is being a bit cavalier, then that might endanger everybody else and that's not appropriate, so. That's great, Jim. I just wanted to add that it's been uh, commented here for both in the um, developed and in the developing world to make sure you keep a, a list of an access, who's actually been around the patient and who's been going in and out. And that's actually part of ICS under the finance, the HR piece. And I can't echo enough that we don't know what we don't know yet, what's going to happen years down, down the road from now. So ask, you know, we learned this in the Army from Gulf War Syndrome and ask any of the firefighters who worked on the pile uh, after 9-11, everybody who sort of wants to come and sort of be helpful, but yet down the road, when something happens, we need to have really good uh, records as to who was there and taking care of the patient. That's great. That's great. So Josh, your description in the talk previous was quite interesting that you've lived through a little bit of both sides of the world. You, you had a patient show up and you had to plan on the spot, and then you've spent a lot of your time now in hours of meetings and, and planning. Um, any perspectives in terms of, you know, just suggestions for people that are at the beginning part of that planning now so they don't end up either in that spot where the patient shows up, but, uh, but also how to do their, their planning effectively and not have it just, you know, take up all their existence so they can't do the rest of their jobs? I, I think there's, there's a wide range of this, this kind of information. I mean, obviously we each need to be individual prepared to, you know, have this, this come in and we need to do our PPE training and we need to, you know, really be aware of, of what's going on and, and, and know how to put on a suit, for example. Um, and an individual emergency department needs to know what room they're going to dedicate, you know, if somebody comes in and their triage process and how they're, you know, what they need to decon after, after triage and stuff like that. Um, I think the thought process that needs to go into this is much more systemic uh, than, than anything. And especially if, the, I mean, if we're talking about, and right now we're only talking about individual cases. We're talking about if one case comes to our emergency department, how are we going to take that? How are we going to put it in the ICU? How are we going to transport that? But if this becomes a more systemic and, and as we were talking about before, a possible endemic, you know, kind of thing in the United States or in West Africa, and we're going to be dealing with this on more of a regular basis, I think we need to start thinking about these things systemically and how do we maintain open lines of communication with the public health department? How do we maintain open supply lines um, and how do we... Um, you know, maintain communication with other healthcare systems. So if, if our healthcare system shut down or if we're resource depleted because we're quarantining all of our doctors and nurses who have come in contact with this patient, how are we going to adequately share the patient load with other, other systems? So I think, in my mind, the systems issues are the ones that, that, that take a, a bit more effort to get, get our heads around than, you know, particularly dealing with one patient. That's great. And thanks, and just our other guests have to leave. Just thanks to Lewis and Mike for coming all the way from Emory for helping us. Uh, Edgar, you had a comment? Yeah, I mean, I think what we, our human nature makes things fizzle out. I mean, and sometimes you have now Ebola, you know, and everybody gets preparedness, whatever, and uh, a few weeks or months later, hopefully we are controlling this, then it fizzles out, and we forget about things. And then something else pops up, let's say uh, another influenza, you know, and then we ramp it up. I think we, we should all be taking care of, of having this readiness, this preparedness, because it may pop up. It, it was Dallas, you know, for us here in the United States. Could have been any other community. It's now New York. You know, it could have been any other place, but we need to have that readiness uh, in our minds all the time and hopefully use this, what we see now, very unusual ways of treating patients, more routine even for some of our enteroviruses or even for some of uh, uh, the situation that we may see with a uh, uh, resistant tuberculosis, right? I mean, this should be more of a routine than an ex exception in our daily management of patients. Yeah, I totally agree. I think we were talking a little bit earlier that as we've been watching this evolve over the past few months, and, and you know, this is, you see this pattern again and again, and this is, there's bits of SARS in this, there's bits of H1N1, there's, there's bits of every disaster are similar here, and there's a lot of similar processes, and that's one of the reasons why we emphasize the stuff that's in the, the guidelines that you can use, not just for Ebola, but for many other things. And, you know, Jim, you've 
gone through a lot from the uh, the, the Pentagon and 9/11 right through to uh, um, uh, Haiti and the in your deployments and you've been teaching disaster stuff for many years. So any other thoughts that you had in terms of just generic principles of, of emergency preparedness that you think are sort of crucial for helping people with the uh, Ebola response and preparedness now? Well, I think as Josh pointed out. You know, when he was downrange in Liberia, you sort of you study all this, but then when it finally hits you in, in front of you, you're trying to th suddenly think about where everything is. And I think uh, the beauty of the supplement, not to plug it too much, but other kind of tools out there, is at least it gives you a roadmap of things to sort of do, and also to sort of uh, when the event hits. But I also want to echo what um, you know what Edgar just said: is is disaster is a four-phase complex. And we sort of forget the mitigation phase, so the things that we can be doing up front to mitigate the impacts of the disaster, whatever they are, that you sort of develop in your old hazard vulnerability analysis. We sort of work on preparing and respond. And then the last thing I want to, you know, sort of end is that we fail to, to, to think about the recovery phase and the reconstitution phase that lasts a long time. So I think we need to sort of look into those kind of uh, components of disaster response as well. Yeah, I completely agree. And I, I think the mitigation phase is the thing that's most often overlooked. And I think mitigation is such a broad type of thing. And, and, and when you study this, you know, and especially, I mean, I think what's harming us so much here is the, the kind of panic response that the public is, is generated. And I think a mitigation can include things like good science education for young children. And so just a good, healthy, robust community is, you know, is a community that's more prepared to respond to a disaster. Yeah, I really liked your comment earlier as well about resilience, and that's one of the things certainly from SARS and H1N1 and other times we've learned that, you know, and the Brits do this really well. They, they don't call it a disaster plan, they call it a resiliency plan. And, um, and that's what they're, you know, it's about getting through it and, and moving forward. Um, Edgar? Yeah, I just wanted to make a comment. I think, and I, I have my hopes, really, that from now on things are going to be a little better match because we have been for the last 10, 11 years having a disparity be between what the critical care community is practicing. And you see the preparedness from Emory. There was no CDC guidance on that. I mean, Emory was doing their own, and the same thing happened. Even the NIH was having their own readiness, you know, which was not uh, uh, parallel to what the CDC recommendations were there. And I thought that was a burden for many, many years. I hope that with the changes that we have seen as of last week, we will see hopefully in the future much better preparedness in all of our hospitals as, as things have matched up. Yeah, I think, and as you said about building confidence in people to come to work, it's important. Uh, one of the things I did a few weeks ago, and we had some of our first uh, uh, planning meetings in the uh, infection practitioner controls or my other colleagues when I'm wearing my ID hat were saying, okay, this is what we decided about PPE, this is what we're going to do. I was like, no, no, okay. First off, bring all your stuff, come to the ICU. You're going to sit down, you're going to sit down with our doctors, our nurses, our ICU team. You're going to tell us what you're thinking about and you're going to get their input. And we're all going to talk together about what's going to work in our ICU. And that's how we developed our PPE plan. And I think doing that made a huge difference in terms of buy-in from our staff and the engagement with them about, uh, about their safety and their protection and how this plan is going to work. And, you know, it's easy to say and come up with a plan for this happening um, uh, on paper. It's hard to actually do it if you've never really been in the ICU or spent any time looking after patients there. And, it's, and you really need a, that cooperative approach between both the people who are going to be using um, the PPE as well as those that are going to be recommending PPE. Um, Sorry, I'll get off my soapbox because you guys are supposed to be doing the talking. <laughs> um, so uh, back when you were in Africa, the, uh, uh, after that first patient um, and you sort of locked down the hospital and, uh, and that first sort of few days, what happened afterwards? Did you have more patients that immediately showed up? Did, you, how, did, they, did they become an Ebola treatment center or did they still no, they, uh, send everyone elsewhere? So they, they, they actually opened their cholera unit, which was off-site to become an Ebola treatment center. Um, and, but we st I mean, the, the lockdown was for the main hospital and they were able to divert a, a number of cases uh, in the immediate aftermath of that based on the, the screening process we set up. Unfortunately, when, when their staff started dying, uh, the hospital did close down for a period of time. So this is the, the primary hospital in the city um, and, and it was shut for a few days. And even uh, when it reopened the emergency department and seeing new patients was uh, was closed down, and so they they've now reopened, and, and they're still using some of the same protocols to divert patients. So they are not an Ebola treatment center. And uh, in terms of um, 
uh, other patients were, were there any other Ebola patients still when you were arriving or did you have to leave? Did you so I think we, we, so I, I don't have any confirmation, but we, we successfully diverted, uh, I think it was four or five patients who we had determined were high likelihood to have Ebola to these Ebola treatment centers within one week after the aftermath. Were there any key lessons that you had from that experience you brought back to uh, uh, to your work that you're doing now in Indiana? Um, well, one of the things I think we worry about is, is in one of the things we thought about a lot in there is that so many people were coming with fever. You know, it, it is not an easy thing to, to, to say that this person has Ebola. It's a very generalized, you know, kind of illness. And so I, I, I you know, I think a lot of the discussion we've been having today is b between treating a known Ebola patient versus treating an undifferentiated patient. And I think part of the things that scares me is that undifferentiated patient that comes to our hospital and we are frightened enough that we don't provide treatment for something else that could be treated. Um, or, uh, as, as we were talking about earlier, um, that when flu season gets here in the next few months and we ha start having more and more patients come in with generalized illnesses and we start screening more and more people for Ebola, that we are going to quickly overwhelm our isolation systems, our PPE systems, because we are so hypervigilant. Um, and I think that's the thing that worries about me. Worries me is the stress that it's going to be putting on our healthcare system because of the the breadth that we're we're looking at uh, for these patients. And the chances are the big concern is uh, actually the risk that patients with a day to day, I mean, are, are going to show up. I mean, the chances are when you see someone even coming from these areas having fever that they may have malaria more more even than Ebola, right? I mean, so so there's so many things that, that are concerning and, and we need to try to keep that fine balance. Uh, for us, the challenge was out of the 500 clinics, I mean, we need to have even screening areas where we we, we have a step increase. We have an algorithm that I'm, I'm going to share with the ACCP where we have been able to, from the general patient consultation, you know, to the 43 different EDs, to having a, a hub where patients will eventually be concentrated, you know, at some of the largest facilities if you really have a confirmed case. But how you get there is going to be very important because otherwise it's going to be overwhelming if you try to put everybody on isolation. And you may be denying care to someone that really needs it that has mm -hmm. absolutely nothing to do with Ebola. Yeah, that's one, certainly one of the highest risks is the failure to be able to treat other people adequately. And as I mentioned, uh, you know, with one hand tied behind your back and keep the rest of your emergency department running to take care of all the other issues while people are still coming in. Our institution actually, in, in a lot of our planning, we've involved uh, an ethicist, and I'm not sure if other hospitals are doing this too, because I think there is that potential not only to potentially withhold care from somebody who has something treatable because we're concerned for Ebola, but also how we're willing to protect ourselves. And are we willing to withhold care for somebody who does have Ebola or like maybe dialysis or, or other invasive procedures in protection of ourselves? So I think in that planning stage, having ethics on board and having that, those people to help the discussion is, is, a, is a good pro part of the process. One of the documents that we're going to post is one on ethics that, that at least the corporation had out and saying if you are not properly protected, I mean, I mean, you're not obligated to treat. I mean, that's one of the things that yeah. But yeah. that's what we have to discern very quickly. Yeah, that's also in the uh, consensus statement. Mm -hmm. um, so say, Edgar, if I'm a doc in your ICU, and it's the ICU that's been chosen to look after Ebola patients, just can you give me sort of a snapshot? What would training look like for me? How much time would I have to invest in this? What would, my, what would the package of training that you envision for, uh, so, for a Some doc of the be? things, absolutely. Some of the things that we have changed is, for example, uh, out of volunteers, we, we have made um, at least per bed. I mean, you are going to have two nurses per shift. I mean, each nurse is going to be of a 12-hour shift. Is each nurse is going to be switching every three hours, so we have a three hours of paper only within the patient, and only to, similar to what other experiences have been to have one designated physician for treating the Ebola patients. I mean, that has no other contact with other patients, you know, but it's, it's dedicated to that, properly trained and everything. So, so that that's pretty much. But the task is you easily go to a two-to-one two nurses per one patient per shift. So you would need, in a, in a 24 hour shift per patient, you would need four nurses. Yeah, it's, that's it's certainly good to talk about the staff coverage. I was uh, thinking more about um, if I'm the actual doctor who's gonna be looking after the Ebola patient, how many, how many hours is it? Do you put me through, a, is it a walkthrough course? Are you, am I watching this online? What's your vision of training for a no, no, healthcare they, worker? They go, they go through the whole deal. I mean, they need to be not only tested, 
but they need to be proficient. They need to have a, 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 a set of skills. Our ED doctors, our ICU physicians that are going to be training on these patients go through the training like anybody else, and they need to demonstrate proficiency. I'm pretty sure that that's what you do as well. Yeah, it's very rigorous. Uh, when we were doing our planning, uh, we talked to the CNO from Emory, and now, now that he's gone, maybe uh, hopefully I'm close. The, uh, the staffing ratio was 93 staff for 10 patients, so about 10 to 1 is what they needed to sort of run run that sort of uh, taking care of the patients. And then as far as the preparation, they did have a standardized training protocol, and you had to remember the old days of getting ACLS and the right amount of compressions per minute or whatever, four flawless donning and doffing uh, procedures before you were sort of given the check mark to be able to go take care of the patient. So it's pretty rigorous. One of the things that we include also, there's no house staff. This is all senior right. physicians yeah. treating these patients. Right. Yeah. No, no, our, no our, our institution has is, is, uh, instituted a no learner policy on these patients as well. So Yeah, I think that's, that's pretty common. Mm -hmm. um, let me just see if we have anything coming in from Twitter, no uh, emails yet from you guys? Nothing? No? Okay, good. <laughs> now he sent me a text message. Uh, <laughs> it's the problem is that five other people have texted me in the past couple of minutes, too. So, <laughs> ah, question from Twitter. Here you go. Happy hour. Um, how do healthcare workers spend quarantine time? Well, actually, actually, that would have been good for our other guests, okay. Okay. but uh, um, I don't think any of you have been quarantined. Um, any thoughts? Have you heard anything? No. <laughs> Yeah. A bunch of my colleagues, and I was lucky not to be quarantined after SARS, but a bunch of my colleagues, uh, colleagues were quarantined, and uh, um, they caught up on a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, uh, mini-series. I think 48 was really popular for one of them back then, and uh, a few things like that. But it's, it, is, it is a big issue that, uh, that we're having to face now, and, and uh, will also be an ongoing issue in the future, it seems. Um, oh, go ahead. Okay, so the question was, because a lot of systems are talking about volunteer staffing instead of actually required staffing, which is another whole controversial issue we'll maybe address in a moment, um, but should these volunteers be compensated in some additional way? Do you have any thoughts from the panel? I, I, I can't. I mean, everybody's developing their early HR policies. What I understood on a phone call from memory was that some of their rest time was compensated as work time. So in other words, they didn't get necessarily get hazard duty pay, although that's also been described in other places as well. But the rest and recuperation time was, in essence, admin time for you to sort of get paid and to get back into it. So that was one approach. It's the same as, I think, when a, uh, you know, during any disaster, like if you're in a long-term snowstorm, uh, like we had in Indianapolis, we, we mandated uh, nurses stay on site uh, because of travel restrictions, and they were compensated during that. So, I mean, I mean, I think this is a you know generalized HR thing that other people have to deal with. But if you're putting people in mandatory quarantine, you know, I think you know there there, there should be some consideration for for that type of thing. We used to have it in Florida with hurricanes, not yeah. with, yeah. <laughs> and five months ago I moved to Dallas. So here, <laughs> here you are. <laughs> Yeah, and that's it. I know in the supplement, both in the surge section under human resources and in the legal section, we talk about these things because you have to have a lot of this stuff pre-thought out in your nursing agreements, your union agreements and stuff beforehand, whether you can or can't um, have some of these uh, fle this flexibility. Um, so what are you doing at each of your institutions or your areas in terms of staffing? Um, uh, volunteered or uh, uh, mandatory or undecided so far? Edgar? The what? The, sorry? So if you, for in terms of staffing uh, um, for dealing with patients with Ebola, are you requiring people, are you saying you know, you're on call this day, you're on shift, this is the person, or are you doing a volunteer? Strictly volunteer, believe it or not. But we have an overwhelming response from physicians, uh, respiratory therapists, and, and nurses. Jim? So I work for VA, and so this is my opinion, not Uncle Sam's. The, um, the concept is that there, as, a, as a federal employee that you would be uh, sort of, this is what you have to come to work, and this is what your duty is. I, I think the, the intent, though, is to get volunteers who are skilled to do the job, and those who are not or would choose not to and decide, they would be obligated to serve elsewhere in the facility so that trained people could come and work in this kind of environment. So that, that's my opinion, and that's kind of where we're going. But bring people to work, you're, you're obligated to take care of patients, but we really want skilled people who really want to be in that setting. 
Have you guys addressed this? Yeah, we're, we're all volunteer at this point. Um, although personally, I, I kind of do have a strong sense of, of obligation and duty. I mean, this is what I was trained for. This is, you know, what, what I took an oath to do, so. Yeah. But, but I think that the skill is very important. I, I think as you choose your volunteers, not only you need to make sure that their skill set is adequate, but also their personalities are adequate. You cannot have one of the persons that is disruptive, whatever, even though they may be very well trained, you know, because this is a game of patience. Things have to move slowly mm -hmm. um, because you have to anticipate many of the things. This is not something that you, in the spur of the moment, you're going to do things. So not only uh, you need to anticipate what your next move is going to be, number one, but very importantly, as you don and off, you have to do it with time and, and with patience and make sure that it's done the right way, step by step. Okay, so I'm going to play Donahue for a bit now, and we'll uh, do a few of the questions from the audience. Um, are there specific staff that are exempt from taking care of patients um, uh, pregnant or uh, immunocompromised because of medications? Do you guys have a list of those recommendations? You know, address that. Yes, we do have. Uh, for example, HR has been very clear that if you're pregnant, you know, if you are, uh, you know, a higher risk healthcare worker, I mean, you're not going to be in someone that is going to be for three or four hours into one of these papers, if they get into trouble, I mean, they, they're not going to be able to don that quickly, doff that quickly, sorry, so, uh, or people to don to go assist them. So it is something that you, you need to be in some degree of fitness, I mean, to be able to go there. And, and the other thing is uh, pr pregnancy has always been a, a major no-no for anybody. The, the other thing is trying to follow OSHA regulations. So for an N95 or a PAP, you have to be fit tested and go through that kind of regulation. So that in some ways can, might, might exclude people from working in that setting. So our, Steve Simpson, University of Kansas, um, our healthcare systems uh, chief medical officer has kind of dictated for the physician staff that he wants people that are older with kids out of the house, which is fine by me, I kind of like doing this and and uh, we have a little bit of experience with a rule out patient already um, what do you think about that i'm ambivalent because it suggests then that your ppe is inadequate absolutely it sends that message <laughs> yeah absolutely that, that's, a, that's a kind of a mixed message there right i mean maybe maybe we want to pay you for a pension right now no no, the, the, I, I think it is, it is a problem. I mean, the, we, we did some testing uh, as, as we were getting ready to make sure that everybody was on board and they felt safe. And we literally splattered people, aerosolized stuff using glow germ. And we showed in a dark room how not one speck was seen on the, when you removed that. So if you do the step by step and you do what the, a good protocol, I mean, you shouldn't have any risk by age at all uh, put into, into your equation, right? So, but, but then you need people with experience, that's it. I mean, that's like uh, Louis Robinson was saying earlier, that's not the day where you would have someone to train how to do an airway or how to get an IV line or something like that. You want to have someone with experience doing the procedure. Yeah. And I think it's also a balance that uh, Lewis also pointed out that um, even if even with PAPRs, uh, PPE is hot and uncomfortable and you have to be able to, to withstand it, be in it for potentially long periods of time. So you need right. people that are you know, physically able to do that and not you know, going to be passing out and having to be dealt with as a second problem in the, uh, in the isolation room. So okay. you had a question? So um, one of the, uh, we're one of the institutions um, that is going to be appointed from our state to uh, take these patients. And my question was about your recovery phase. I've heard that uh, Texas Presbyterian has had a very big plummet in consultations and elective surgeries. And just wondering, um, what will it take to kind of make sure that an institution stays financially viable um, if this really does ramp up and um, these appointed hospitals are taking Ebola patients on a regular basis? Yeah, after what happened in Dallas with uh, Texas Presbyterian, I mean, it is uh, very important to, uh, we, we call this fear Ebola, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, this is, this is uh, there's, there's a lot of uh, mind games that people play, you know, and in a situation like this where they get, a, a tremendous amount of scare on what's going on, and that if people don't feel safe, this is what happens. I know for a fact that the, there was a drop to about 25 percent of the normal uh, daily census at uh, THR. We, oh, sorry. Uh, 
Uh, I was going to say we actually also have um, so in the audience right now. I found is Jeff Dichter, who actually wrote the business continuity uh, um, section of the the guidelines. <laughs> oh, he's he, there. He always likes to talk about this topic and, and had a presentation to the IOM about it a couple of years ago. So, you have any thoughts on that? So, we didn't find much literature when we looked at this about five years ago, and I haven't seen much since when we did the consensus statement. So, what I would say is the following: is I think, uh, and I'm from Minnesota, and our hospital has been designated as one of the three too. So I think that your health system at a political level has to really deal with the, the government. I don't know the state and local governments as well as I don't know how we're going to deal with the federal government. But there's, to my knowledge, there's no financial mechanism uh, to compensate for this. But it's really important, especially if you're a designated hospital. But it's really, I think, something that has to be taken care of at a political level. Michael, and let me just do to com what, what has happened is that uh, you see institutions, not only ours but some others, trying to use some of their uh, centers for uh, chronic uh, acuity care, you know, and, and things like that being used, so to deflect, I mean, to keep the hospital as functioning on the day-to-day -day business as much as possible and to move these patients to uh, almost like a sanatorium kind of, I mean, to a place where, where they can be treated properly where all this, uh, instead of just having a unit, having a, a, a physical independent place to, to make sure that the hospital continues to work uh, in, a, in the best possible way. Yeah, and that's been a you know, challenge, sort of, again, everything comes around again, but uh, in our discussion back with SARS having specific right. institutes, but uh, it becomes a challenge when you're trying to provide critical care in an area like that that isn't often set up and staffed and established and doesn't have the, you know, the um, medical gas and suction, everything uh, in place to be able to provide that level of care. The other thing that um, that hasn't come up so far, a couple of people have mentioned though, is that having you know one physician designated as the Ebola doctor, who has like two patients a day, and, uh, and then it comes from Jeff's work. But how do you compensate that person, and how do you cover for that and the, those issues that arise? Um, any other questions from the audience? Oh, we've got one way over here. <coughs> So related to what you just said, I work at NYU Medical Center and Bellevue is part of our mm -hmm. system and, and now we have four full-time intensivists taking care of one patient that affects our coverage at night for our other hospital. Uh, nurses, a ton of nurses are covering this one patient so there's a nursing shortage in our ICU of Bellevue so people are being transferred to the university hospital. Is, are you setting up systems ahead of time or should we where we have the ability to transfer to other hospitals as more patients come in, we're going to have shortage of professionals. Yeah, so any comments from the board? Certainly in Ontario, we're setting up uh, regionalized Ebola centers, and um, and this is one of the things we you know, SARS and other things demonstrated. Only a small number of patients can completely shut down your entire healthcare system, and that's why the business of continuity and the other aspects are in, important to maintain that. So regionalized centers. Uh, any comments from the uh, from the panel? The, the centers that we have tried to put together are LTACs, so long-term acute care facilities that would have pretty much medical gases, the redundancy of systems, and pretty much an ICU-like uh, situation where you would just have to move the physicians. But the, obviously, the, the, there's going to be a strain, a stress in your in your uh, population of physicians and nurses, right? I mean, there's that any any situation like this is going to be very stressful for the for the numbers of people that you can uh, have as volunteers even. No, I, I, I agree completely. I mean, we're having the same discussion with, you know, if, you know, if you're a large group, it's one thing, but if you're a small rural hospital and Ebola comes to you, um, I, I personally, you know, and th this isn't the opinion of my state, but the, personally, I think the regional healthcare system or centers of excellence or whatever you want to call it is, has to be the way to go. Somebody who can absorb that, that hit um, personnel-wise. Hey, my name is Eric Gottesman. I work for North Shore University in uh, Long Island. And so we're having this whole big thing about who's going to volunteer. Um, and so one of the questions that's holding back a lot of the volunteers is even if we don all the papers and we don and and off, who is going to be quarantined for yeah. 21 days? Um, yeah. So a lot of people who have kids at home, and if they're going to go in with papers and everything looks good, are they still going to be quarantined for 21 days, or are they going to be allowed to go home? Or You're going to talk to Governor talk to Cuomo Governor about Cuomo. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I will tell you, you know, experience of one of our friends from um, Hong Kong during SARS is they just moved into the hospital. I mean, at that point, he, he 
there were so many unknowns he didn't want to go home yeah. to his kids so that was kind of his approach and then there's all those kind of issues of supporting staff so that they want to stay to work taking care of kids taking care of their pets all, all those kind of things so that people you know feel empowered to come to work yeah, I think one of the most important things Jim said too is to have a supportive spouse uh, my wife is very angry with me when I came back from Africa, but I mean, that's important. You have to have these discussions with your family. Yeah, unfortunately, um, we're going to have to wrap up here now because our hour is over. But uh, um, certainly a, a lot of this, uh, you can keep tweeting and uh, we'll see if people come to answer questions online. Um, but thank you all for the panel coming and for the audience for uh, uh, attending today. Thank you for coming. And uh, best of luck with your Ebola preparations. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you.